Good morning and welcome to this uh, webinar. Welcome to the Embassy of Spain. We are broadcasting live, as it were. We've set up a small TV studio here at the Chancery uh, of the Embassy of Spain in the heart of the European uh, Quarter. Uh, welcome to this uh, public diplomacy uh, program, uh, Los Mediodías de la Embajada, and particularly Spain Means Innovation, which is an initiative of the Spanish Chamber of Commerce here in Luxembourg and Belgium. And today we are devoting this special edition uh, to COVID-19. Uh, of course, the course uh, uh, two that causes COVID-19. And we're bringing together a panel of experts. We're very fortunate from three different countries, from Spain, Luxembourg, and Belgium. And uh, we'll be introducing them uh, throughout the webinar. Please pay attention to our uh, chat because we'll be posting additional uh, links and materials that you can uh, consult. We want this to be a conversation on different initiatives, ideas, solutions on, on, on this pandemic that we're all enduring. And of course, a lot is being said. A lot has been said. A lot will be said about the pandemic. We're very modest about this. We'd be very happy if you're able to at least draw one interesting idea or initiative that you didn't know about. And also if we are able to promote, which is the ultimate goal of this program, to promote networking and relations uh, between researchers, industries, innovators amongst these different countries and beyond. Without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, the ambassador of Spain to the Kingdom of Belgium, who will do the official opening of this webinar, Beatriz La Rocha Palma, embajadora, por favor. Bonjour, buenos dias, good morning. It is a privilege to welcome you to the lab, this fantastic space of the Spanish Embassy, which we dedicate to cultural and scientific activities and exchanges between Belgium and Spain. On this special occasion, we are also very happy to include Luxembourg. Professor Katri, thank you so much for your presence here today. I wish to thank also the speakers for their participation. Permítame asimismo un saludo especial a los científicos y a las instituciones españolas que participan y han hecho posible esa actividad. First, to provide new information or ideas. You might not have yet heard about regarding COVID-19. And second, to promote networking and closer relation amongst researchers, institutions, and industries from the three countries. In addition, this webinar is a practical exercise of the science, technology, and innovation diplomacy efforts of Spain, Belgium, and Luxembourg, which we bring to you in collaboration with the Spain National Research Council, the Spain Office for Science and Technology, and the Spain Official Chamber of Commerce in Belgium and Luxembourg through a special edition of our public cycle, Los Mediodías de la Embajada. Mankind is engaged like never before in the fight against the current pandemic. There is a fundamental driving force behind these efforts, including the huge scientific working, the entrepreneurial spirit and the innovative technological solution on which we will present a few examples today. I'm eager to listen to you. Muchas gracias. Un grand merci, Dan Kubel, and thank you so much for tuning in and enjoy this webinar. Gracias, Embajadora. And now, as part of this official uh, opening, I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Katri Bodewin, who is the head of service of healthcare associated infections 
uh, an antimicrobial resistance from Cienzano. Let me tell you just uh, a little bit about, about Dr. Bodewin. I also want to tell you that we have complete profiles on all the uh, speakers that you can find on our, you will see on the chat. Uh, we'll give you the direct link on spainculture.be. You, uh, you can download the PDF file with the uh, detail on each of the speakers. Uh, Dr. Budwin Katri is a researcher with a special interest in antimicrobial resistance. Between 2000 and 2007, he combined ambulatory practice and obstetrics as a veterinary surgeon with laboratory research at the Ghent University, University of Ghent. He started to work at Cienzano, this uh, agency, the Belgian agency devoted to, to public health in 2007 where he integrated veterinary epidemiological approaches in human research projects. Since 2009, he's in charge of the service healthcare associated infections and antimicrobial resistance, as I said earlier, and he's involved in national and international committees on the prudent use of antimicrobials and infection prevention. He is co-founder back in 2013 of the outbreak support team for multi-drug resistant organisms in Belgian hospitals. Since 2018, he's lecturer of epidemiology at the Faculty of Medicine in Brussels at the ULB, Université Libre de Bruxelles. Uh, we are very honored to have the professor here today with us. We asked him to give, as we always do with these uh, webinars, uh, along with our ambassador, we have someone who represents the, 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 the policy making uh, side of things. And, and we, we are very honored to have here Dr. Budewin Katri to, to tell us a little bit about a general perspective uh, on, the, on the Belgian approach to this uh, pandemic. Professor, good morning to you and thank you for being here. Thank you very much. I will share my screen and uh, thank you for this kind uh, introduction. Buenos dias. I will share my screen and give you an overview of how in Belgium our institute works with the COVID pandemic. Is my screen clear for you? Is this clear for you, Mr. President? Okay, thank you. So um, we are a institute that combines both human, veterinary, and environmental research for public health. And whereas in former days, our mission was to have a long, healthy life, now we intend to have an overall healthy, long life. So we have more ambition. We do a lot of activities. One of the main goals in Belgium in the current COVID crisis is to monitor the mortality, and I will show you some um, daily updated graphs. We have a harmonized surveillance in nursing homes, so in long-term care facility, and uh, we can be proud because ECDC, so the European Center for Disease Control and Prevention, has found that we were an example for other countries in Europe. We have a lot of data. I will show some of these right in a minute. And we have projects that would like to combine because in all countries, there is different authorities that have responsibilities for prevention, for finance, for, prevent, uh, for curative medicine and so on. We would like to have databases that are linked. And two of these projects are LinkFAC, in particular for the vaccine efficacy and Helicon in which we want to measure the long-term effects, both on a physical, long hauling, for instance, and mental health aspect. We also have daily reporting, and I will show you an example right away. We have all hospitals that participate in Belgium, voluntary, but we have a coverage between 60 and 90 percent of participation, depending on which wave we were. We have follow-up investigations in schools, in nursing homes. We have seroprevalence studies among children, blood donors, hospitals, and primary healthcare workers. And we have a 
surveillance in wastewater. We do it now for COVID, but in the long term, we would like to extend it for other viruses and even antimicrobial resistance issues. We have a monitoring of general practitioners. So we have influenza-like illness monitorings. Uh, so the abbreviation is ILI. And we have a direct line with the government, with the different authorities, to via the RAC, so the Risk Assessment Group. We have health service already. The sixth is launched since the start of the pandemic to evaluate both physical and mental health and to see to what extent measures taken were complied with by the general public. And we have uh, other studies ongoing specific for in the long term, making the difference between COVID and other um, flu-like syndromes. So this is to just show you that the direct effects on your left, uh, the mortality and morbidity are monitored in real time for the moment. And the projects we intend to is to have the indirect effects both on physical and mental health in the long term. We have a follow-up for positive cases and for hospitalized cases. And I will show some of these data here for in in uh, particular the vaccination for the moment uh, we have according to the different regions uh, brussels flemish walloon and the german speaking region we can have an idea of the total um, population and also a stratification this is the younger than 18 and it is the population older than 65 so we would like to have a monitoring in view we have a dashboard which is consulted and uploaded, updated every day, in which in English, so user-friendly even for international purposes, you can follow up the vaccination status, the number of cases, hospitalizations, the number of uh, fatalities, the number of tests, the situation in the municipalities, so people at the local level can also um, consult this information. And we have studies as, for instance, the seroprovalence studies I showed you. So again, for the vaccination, we have a good stratification by age. And also the timeline over the different weeks is important for both the authorities, but also for the public to keep a motivation high. In uh, particular, the mortality, uh, we follow up and you see here we have until yesterday numbers on the casualties and just to highlight the difference we see um, we see that this is a situation in Belgium we have the three regions in different colors and if you see at the mortality in nursing homes in so the population that has been vaccinated you see that following that campaign the mortality is dramatically improved in these nursing homes and these data we would like now also to uh, be available for the public to have them um, motivation. We have a genomic surveillance on the new uh, strains and you see that since last week we also have the fourth strain, the Indian strain, aside from the Brazilian, the UK and the South African strain. We have a mobility data check uh, from several networks, but one of our main concerns is that all these information available in Google, in Facebook, in uh, the network providers, these are, is available in real time. We have some aggregated data, but because of legislation and privacy issues, we cannot use them by direct um, and that is a point of concern that we need to rethink to what extent can we use these data better for contact tracing and to follow up currently. That's for the future. I would like to thank you very much for your attention and uh, um, welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor and I Thank you for, for staying with us because uh, as, again, thank you for the effort. You gave us a very succinct picture uh, of, of, of the situation, the epidemiological situation in Belgium, of your approach. And we'd be honored if you can stay on uh, for the panel discussion. So thanks, thanks again so very, very much. And now, as part of uh, still this introduction, before we address, we get into the panel discussion, I have the honor to introduce actually a fellow Barcelonia, but I think she's in Brussels presently, Marina. Martinez, who is uh, the, the program on Horizon 2020 and now the 
uh, Europe no? uh, Horizon Program Officer at these, uh, or we already mentioned, Spain's uh, uh, Office for Science and Technology, who is one of the partners of this, uh, of this uh, cycle of this uh, program, Spain Means Innovation. And uh, we have asked Marina, she usually, this is her role in all of our uh, webinars, because remember that these webinars, we used to hold them uh, physically here at the embassy. Uh, and, uh, and we had, a, uh, we had a, a, a twofold challenge. We had a challenge to communicate to a broader audience on, on these important issues. So we all make an effort to try to explain things that sometimes people who are not experts like myself are not obvious. But at the same time, we wanted to promote networking amongst the, the, the different uh, uh, innovators, uh, companies within the different countries. So uh, Marina and Ceretti, this office, play a crucial role in, 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 in doing this. And we will also do this and follow up with people who are following us as part of the audience and also amongst the uh, researchers and institutions participating here today. So Marina, we would be honored if you could give us a broad overview of uh, what's the, the what are the mechanisms or current policies to support this sort of initiatives uh, from entrepreneurs, from researchers within the European framework, and also nationally, and I guess particularly in Spain, uh, as it pertains especially uh, to the fight against the, the pandemic. Marina, muy buen día y bienvenida. Thank you so much, Sergi, for the opportunity. Thank you to the authorities and the remarkable scientists and technical people which is uh, with us today as well with entrepreneurs because one of our, uh, I think that you can hear me correctly and you can see as well the slides. Yes. Okay. So uh, one of the objectives, as you have said, is uh, is to promote the, the the entrepreneurship, the networking among the, the the people which is attending to this meeting and among the organizations that are participating as well. Uh, so I would like to thank a lot to 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 all of you that you are listening from home or for your work uh, places. Uh, so my few slides are regarding the next opportunities that you can find uh, for funding. Uh, projects and uh, industrial developments or serv uh, uh, service developments that you can that you can find uh, regarding advanced materials for health applications uh, in the in in the, this fight against this pandemic. Just to say, we are the Spanish Office for Science and Technology, which is the branding name of the Office of the Na uh, National Innovation Agency in Spain, CDTI. So we are part of the department of the uh, framework program, but uh, and, and we uh, give uh, this support to participating to European programs and concretely to the framework program Horizon Europe in this case, to all sorts of organization, uh, private public companies, NGOs, uh, public sector. So you can find us if you want to participate to these Europe European programs, especially to Horizon Europe. Um, as you have seen uh, since the uh, late 2019, when this uh, pandemic started to show up uh, in, in Europe, many uh, activities has been put in place from European Commission, from the different European bodies and international bodies that I wanted to highlight here. So you have as well the European Institute of Technology that through the KICS, the Knowledge Innovation Communities has put some has launched some actions for the entrepreneurs and for uh, innovative solutions, as well European Commission through the European Innovation Council. One of our speakers is one uh, company which is beneficiary of this instrument for the small and medium enterprises. So we are really honored that uh, they have won this, uh, this award and they will be able to, Im uh, to improve their developments in this, uh, with, with products and services in the, in the, in the fight we against the COVID. And of course, commission with the different lines of funding for innovative solutions that can arrive quickly or relatively quickly to the market in order to help the society and the professionals to fight better against this virus, among other 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 diseases as well. So um, uh, all of these or the main part of this funding are coming for the first chapter of the multiannual financial framework of the European Union 
reunions that is the one related to the single market, to the innovation and digital, but not the only one, as I would like to show at, at the last uh, slide of my presentation. I'm going to focus in Horizon Europe course, which are going to open in the next weeks, so mid uh, May. And uh, the one which is much more related with the question that we are talking today is the one related with advanced materials for the health sector uh, in applications uh, directly a focus in infectious diseases. We are talking about collaborative projects, so you have to present uh, your ideas in a consortium, in a consortium that can be uh, made by uh, public, uh, private organizations, uh, you can uh, find associations of consumers, um, public administration as well, research centers, technological centers, companies, big and small ones, uh, so everybody which is a legal entity is invited to present proposals under the format of a consortium. The projects uh, that, uh, that are going to be fined are research and innovation actions mainly, which means that everybody is going to be funded 100% uh, in this project, which is very interesting. And in all cases, all sort of partners that are participating in this project are going to get the 25% additional indirect cost uh, extra, a part of their uh, budget. So, and who can participate in this, co in this consortium? So in principle, all the uh, organizations, public, private, wherever, profit and non-profit, which are settled in the 27 member states, plus the associate countries. Remember that the UK is still among other associate countries, is still under the uh, signature of this association agreement to the framework program, but the important is that this agreement will be signed at the moment of the deadline of the call. Um, and what are the opportunities? So the clear opportunity that you have uh, starting just in the middle of May is this, uh, this topic, this line of funding uh, for uh, antimicrobial, antiviral and antifungal nano coatings. So we are expecting projects uh, ranging from four to six million euros. As it's a research and innovation uh, action, everybody will be funded 100%. So this four or six million euros is the 100% of your budget. We have for this line 23 million uh, of euros. So I mean, among five and, uh, and four, uh, six projects will be funded. So it's a, it's a real opportunity. And the, the idea is that to, to, to provide so, uh, with passive measures that can be put in place in the common places where we are working to minimize the impact of the future infections outbreaks. Uh, so we are talking about uh, these people which is working with nanoparticles, nano, uh, carbon nanotube, metal oxys, uh, metal oxide nanoparticles, and all of this coating are uh, oriented to minimize the risk of a spread inspection, uh, infections. And, uh, and, and, and the idea of this project is to provide holistic solutions to, 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 the, to the professionals uh, of the hospitals, for instance, but also to the common people that we are working and moving in, in, in our world. The idea is that uh, the small and medium master, uh, enterprises are extremely welcome in order to develop these innovative solutions. And also during the life of the project, it is important to show the effectiveness of the, this fight against a wide range of pathogens. Um, so we have to test these solutions well over high traffic objects like doors, windows, public places, but also schools, elder, elderly homes as well, and or on na uh, coatings for textiles. So both solutions can be possible or only focus one or focus in the on, the on the second one. Uh, this topic is or this line of funding is 
directly related with the well-being of the citizens in the, con in, the con in the context of the COVID pandemics. And I would like to highlight that this is the, let's say, the best uh, funded or the best awarded, but it's not the only one. We have also, but finishing uh, uh, in, the, in the next week, uh, the Inno for Cove projects, which are small projects of uh, 100,000 uh, euros are 100% funded, is uh, oriented to the entrepreneurs for quick and small solutions also, including uh, these uh, materials regarding with infectious diseases. At regional level, you may know that for 2020-2021, uh, Commission is, a, a, is, is, is uh, encouraging the regions to uh, set up interregional pilot actions in order that the regions can fund actions regarding COVID-19, but also circular economy in the health sector for instance, with the materials or the waste of the health sector. And I would like to end my, my slides with showing some results, some excellent results of the Spanish participants in the last framework program Horizon 2020, where Spain is the first country in return with the 21.9% of the EU 27, I 28, in advanced materials and nanotechnologies for healthcare. And with that, I would like to thank you to all of you for your attention and uh, of course I will be here for answering all of your questions as well to help you or support you in the consortium building. Thank you so much Marina. You you in a very succinct way you were able to 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 take us on a journey of the different possibilities and instruments in the new Horizon Europe uh, that are available to us specifically are available to companies, entrepreneurs, to research uh, groups, especially as it pertains to the to the current pandemic. Uh, and, and as you well noted, you 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 really uh, underline this fact that uh, Horizon 2020 now and and the Future Framework Program are open to other countries. It's one of those rare EU programs that are open uh, to 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 other countries outside the EU, which also underlines the fact that we already know of that uh, science has no borders. And because science has no borders and neither this webinar, we're traveling now to Luxembourg. Uh, we, we have the honor today to have uh, with us a Dr. Gérard Chocmel, who is uh, a medical consultant now at the Hôpital uh, Robert Schumann in, in Luxembourg. And Dr. Chocmel, holds both a degree in medicine, so he's a medical doctor, but he's also has a PhD in, in, in science. And uh, he has specialized in infectious diseases. He's, he actually developed an ultra sensitive uh, assay for the detection of HIV uh, RNA in plasma that became an international standard for the management of antiviral therapy in HIV infected individuals. That's, we, should, we should remember that to this day, we don't have a, a, a vaccine for, for the HIV virus. So that underlines as well the amazing effort that has been undertaken that still goes on today. And this is proof, uh, uh, the, all these speakers, wonderful speakers that we have today of how science has uh, mobilized and the challenge they had to produce all these uh, different uh, COVID solutions in, in such a small period of time. Dr. Shokmel spent uh, several years of his career also in the pharmaceutical industry. So in fact, in one person, we have all the different perspectives that we wanted to bring here together, which is the research uh, science side, the industrial, the industry side, mainly pharmaceutical, and also the clinical medical uh, aspect. So he actually incarnates all of this uh, uh, in one. He, uh, he as well, but as I said, he's now a medical consultant at the Hôpital Robert Schumann. So we, all, we will also uh, take advantage of this fact because he's at the receiving end of all these different uh, solutions and initiatives we're discussing. He's now, uh, he's been in the front line like, uh, like all these uh, hospitals and doctors uh, in fighting COVID-19 and thus, they're the ones who know, you know, what kinds of treatments and approaches are working better, what kind of solutions are more appropriate. But uh, he's very well known uh, in this area 
in Luxembourg. He, he, he has participated in many uh, TV and radio shows. So we, we thank him for being here today. We know he has a, a crazy schedule. We thank you all. And, uh, bef but actually I would like to, before we uh, go to Dr. Shogmel, we have the honor as well to connect to the, with the ambassador of Spain uh, in Luxembourg. Uh, to Bernardo uh, de Sicart y Escoda, uh, ambassador, si me permiteo, if you allow me this uh, also uh, linguistic license, this language license, like with Marina, we're all fellow Catalans, Barcelonians, so I would like to greet you in, in our own language. Uh, ambassador, es un honor tener vos aquí y muchas gracias. So please tell us a little more about the Dr. Chomel, you know him better, and about Luxembourg, please. Thank you so much. An honor to have you with us. Yeah. <laughs> Muchas gracias, muchas gracias, gracias, Sergi. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, let me express my deep gratitude to Dr. Shockwell for taking part actively in this webinar about COVID-19 response. Dr. Shockwell is an eminence in this field. He is a very well-known doctor and researcher in Luxembourg, and a recognized researcher everywhere. I hope that after the conversations and the discussions we are going to help today, all of us shall have a better panorama about COVID and its implications. Many thanks as well to the Spanish Chamber of Commerce in Belgium and Luxembourg, and to the Spanish Cultural Center in Luxembourg Antonio Machado. Both of them have helped us to outreach this webinar. I hope you will enjoy the webinar. Thank you to you all. Gracias. Gracias, Ambassador. Gracias, Ambassador. Thank you so much, Ambassador. So again, a good morning, Dr. Chocmel. I would like to ask you, uh, we will also have you on board for the, for the rest of the panel discussion, but I, there are so many questions we have for you, and already I must remind the, the people who are following the webinar that we don't have to wait for the Q&A uh, session. You can send your comments, and we're receiving some already through the chat. Some of us uh, so we received as well through the email, so we will make it as lively as possible. We'll try to have a conversation rather than different a series of presentations. So, Dr. Shokmel, many questions to ask you. But I would like to start with a very basic one. Um, is tell us a bit about your work today, presently, as a, as a medical consultant in such a major hospital. What does it entail as it pertains to the, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Well, that's indeed a very good question to start with, because uh, actually the Robert Schumann hospitals are the biggest hospital group in Luxembourg, and we are four uh, hospital establishments and we have dedicated one of those establishments um, to COVID. So the COVID patients go to one of the, actually to the largest of our hospitals, which is uh, on the Kirchberg Plateau. That's also where you would find uh, the European institutions. So in terms of my functions at uh, this hospital, first I created uh, the laboratories, the multidisciplinary laboratories. Also, I'm involved in antibiotic stewardship, so I feel uh, obviously very close uh, to uh, this Catri. Um, and um, right now, I'm focusing on uh, consultations in infectious diseases. Now, uh, as you can imagine, COVID-19 has taken up a large part of my consultations. Fortunately, there are also the other ones, because otherwise I would become really a COVID specialist that forget about antimicrobial resistance, about bacterial infections, and about uh, all of this. But um, yes, I mean, we haven't been spared from the epidemic, as you can imagine. Um, we were relatively fortunate so one year ago because of the experience of Spain, uh, of France, and of Italy. We were just in time to have our first major lockdown and could prevent the worst. But we were hit very hard uh, last year in autumn with hundreds of people dying actually in nursing homes. And I really took uh, uh, much note of uh, what Dr. Catri said, 
in terms of uh, them having at Science Sano developed a harmonized surveillance nursing home um, system, because that uh, is extremely important. I think in, when we come to prevention, talking about nursing homes and about hospitals, vaccines, as you know, are the solution, but um, there are, is still a lot of vaccine hesitancy in the population and even among healthcare professionals. And so the rate of vaccination among um, healthcare professionals in the hospital sector in Luxembourg is about two thirds. But if you go to nursing homes, it's about 52%. Uh, and if you go to those services that actually deliver care to patients at home, uh, it, is, it is disastrously low. I have been told that it would be around 6% right now. So that is something we have to work on. And what I personally think, because we are talking about ideas about how to, to better address uh, uh, transmission and prevent transmission, is as long as we allow uh, even healthcare professionals to decide whether yes or no, they want to get vaccinated. I, I think that establishments at least should know who's vaccinated among their staff and physicians and who's not vaccinated. Because if we consider our highly vulnerable uh, persons uh, who are really at risk of uh, severe COVID and of dying, then obviously we would want to surround them with staff, with physicians, with uh, personnel that have been vaccinated. So I think that is a, a very important uh, first topic uh, to be thought about. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Schockmel. Before we proceed, I also wanted to, to I've, I've heard you on, on other media discuss in a very pedagogical way about uh, vaccines uh, that you just discussed uh, as well and, and tests. And I wanted to take advantage because again, we have a general audience. I include myself as one of them, non-experts. And I would like you to please, if you could take some time. So before we get into the uh, nitty gritty specifics that we will see now with the different researchers and the different initiatives with the with Pharma uh, Belgium. If you can uh, give us an idea of of testing and where we are now today with testing, different types of tests, the implications whether they are viral, not what what, what are the uses now that you see and how they are evolving in terms of your uh, current reality as a you know a, a, as a as a medical consultant for this large hospital. Please. Well, absolutely. I think uh, that fortunately we are evolving to a large use of rapid tests. And uh, uh, up to now, uh, at least in our country and in most countries, the gold standard for testing were the PCR tests. I mean, with the PCR test, you would detect viral RNA. That will not tell you whether that uh, virus is still viable because it's uh, enough to have fragments of viral RNA for the PCR to be positive. And although one knows that there's a certain correlation between the number of cycles you need uh, during your assay uh, for finding a positive result, there's still no clear cutoff because the different PCRs uh, have different characteristics. Now, being the gold standard, PCR still has one major problem. So first of all, as I said, um, the positive PCR does not tell you whether the, there's viable virus. It can just be fragments uh, that are remnant <clears throat> after some kind, uh, after a, an infection that might be remote for several weeks. And also, sorry, <clears throat> it doesn't tell you whether the person is infectious. So a problem, <clears throat> sorry, we have been confronted with is uh, really that people can remain PCR positive for quite a while, for several weeks. And what does that mean? Now, do they need to be in isolation? Can healthcare workers return to work? And so here is uh, the, the rapid test that become interesting because the rapid tests are less sensitive than the PCR test. And that is actually an advantage because they won't tell you about people who might have some traces still of viral RNA detectable in their nasopharyngeal secretions. 
Um, and that's good because basically you don't know, want to know about that if the question is, is the person infectious, is the person not infectious? Uh, the other thing is that these tests are becoming widely available, that they, will, they are at relatively low cost and that they give you a result very quickly. I mean, after 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And this is important because a PCR test generally needs, uh, the sample needs to be returned to the laboratory and then the laboratory needs to perform the analysis and then communicate the analysis to you, perhaps by a mobile phone, but with a uh, rapid test, obviously you almost have an immediate answer. Now that answer is not, uh, doesn't tell you about the future. Uh, it might be valuable, it certainly is valuable for one day, um, it is not valuable for a week or more, and it's not a definitive answer of whether you are infected or not infected, but it certainly uh, gets you, provides you with information whether you are infected. In this context, I was privileged uh, to be involved with the pilot uh, project in Germany. And tomorrow, actually, the very first hospital, actually there are two hospitals in the same, uh, no, sorry, a hotel, we have two hotels uh, in the same group that will open as a pilot project and have the authorization to do so for the next four weeks to come uh, is exactly based on rapid tests. So we have developed a certain concept that involves uh, obviously hygiene measures and precaution and distancing and face masks and all that, but that also involves rapid tests for guests and for personnel. So I think this will be quite an interesting pilot project because if successful, um, many of the concepts therein they could be extended uh, either in the hospitality sector to other hotels, but also to other institutions. So I think that rapid tests might be leading the way and also might allow us um, to progressively loosen restrictions, because even if we have rapid tests, we won't uh, immediately stop the wearing face masks or practice social distancing. So basically these are added on top of each other. And um, so I think uh, this is actually a, a big step ahead in terms of uh, normalizing our lives. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shokmel. Uh, uh, this is fascinating. In fact, we will hear in, in a few minutes from, from David uh, Gehring, who is the, you know, who is here on behalf of Pharma Valley, which is a conglomerate of over 130 pharmaceutical companies. And, and I think it'll be very interesting if you can stay with us, uh, Dr. Shokmel, to have a discussion also with the scientists that I'll introduce now. Uh, about some of the solutions that we'll present. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shakmel. And now, again, no borders, so we continue to, to travel uh, and we're gonna travel to Spain. But before we do that, I'd like to, to explain to you that uh, a part of this, uh, you can see in some of the slides and actually through the, through the camera right now in the background, some of the photos that are hung up here. We, we, this is a space, the, the Spain Arts and Science Lab in Belgium that we use for experimentation like labs are uh, for uh, in the arts and the sciences. And we are particularly keen uh, uh, on, and, and we favor actually this tandem uh, between the arts and the sciences, this dialogue. And today we're lucky to have a, this uh, exhibit called Fotciencia, uh, photo science, which is basically a, a, a scientific uh, photographic uh, competition that has been going on for, for a number of years, organized by FESIC and FECIT, which are respectively uh, Spain's uh, National Research Council and Spain's Foundation for Science and Technology. And you can see there is some, actually we're gonna go into nanotechnology. So you have some nanoparticles, you have some wildlife. Uh, so we actually wanted to have this uh, atmosphere as part of, the, of this exhibit. We have here today, actually, uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, the director of, of, of the Spain's Office of Science and Technology, Andres Martinez, but we have with us here today in this hybrid uh, digital format uh, of this webinar, Berta Martinez, who is uh, the person, the officer that's uh, at the uh, office 
of the of Spain's Na National Research Council, or TESIC, here in Brussels. In fact, we call it La Casa de la Ciencia, the House of Science, that actually incorporates not only uh, the TESIC uh, and the mentioned uh, uh, Spain's Office of Science and Technology, but also researchers from different uh, universities in, in, in Spain. So now I would like to, as I said, we're traveling to Spain, we're going to Madrid, we are actually going to the uh, uh, Nanomaterials and Nanotechnology Research Center uh, in Madrid. It's called El, El Fin, which is, uh, uh, this is the acronym in, in Spanish. Marina already said, she concluded her slides in saying how uh, Spain, uh, she gives some percentages, examples, has really, uh, has an outstanding record on the application of nanotechnology to medical uh, solutions and specifically COVID. So we have asked uh, Adolfo Fernandez, who is the director of this uh, research center, and Belen Caval, who is the, uh, the, the lead investigator, to, to tell us a bit about some of these uh, applications, how nanotechnology has been used uh, in, in fighting this pandemic. Uh, before uh, doing so, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about, about uh, the two of them. Adolfo Fernandez is actually uh, an organic uh, chemist uh, by, by training. He, his uh, doctoral thesis was on the study of the surface properties of carbonaceous materials and its use in methods of, of separation. He, has, uh, uh, he joined uh, the group of nano-structured uh, materials and uh, he is also responsible for this, uh, for this research center, the THIN. He's, uh, he's been principal investigator for more than a dozen projects, getting global funding over 1.5 million euros. And, uh, and then after Adolfo, we will hear from, from Belen Cabal, who is the lead investigator of this uh, actual project that, uh, that they want to tell you about. But before we go, we, could, we talk to Belen and, and, and get the specifics on this a COVID solution coming from, from this research center in Madrid. I wanted to ask Adolfo to, to, again, thank you for being with us here today, to tell us a bit about, because you're, it happens, you're a scientist, but you're also a manager. You have to get uh, funding for your center. You, if you, can, uh, you were telling us I was privileged because I spent uh, a few days talking to all of you. I had to make sense of, 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 as I said, I'm not an expert, a specialist in all these fields, and I had to uh, really understand in order to make it, you know, understandable to also the, the people who are following. And I was marveled at the speed and flexibility in which you were able to readapt some of your uh, research schemes. And I think you told me maybe less than a month and a half, uh, there was this special funding from, from the Spanish government, from the Spanish uh, National Research Council, and you were able to completely modify your research that was based on, on bacterial, no? Uh, mm -hmm, yes. uh, basis and, and, and redirected to this virus. So, uh, Adolfo, again, thank you so much for being here. And Belen, please tell us a bit about, about the center, about the work that you do, so we can understand better this challenge that you've had to face as scientists. Thank you so much for being with us. Okay, uh, good morning to, to everybody. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizer for, for inviting us to participate in this webinar. Only a small uh, detail that we are placed in Spain, but in the north of Spain, in Asturias, uh, not in Madrid, but this is, this is not important. We are a, a research center, uh, CINN, the Nanomaterials and Nanotechnology Research Center, is a, a mixed institute participated by CSIC, uh, the University of Oviedo and, and Principality of Asturias. And we are specialized in the synthesis, preparation, and characterization of multifunctional materials, especially ceramic materials, for different application fields, uh, such as uh, health, components for big science, uh, industry, or uh, information and communication uh, technologies. Uh, talking in the particular case of uh, health applications, uh, we are working on different solutions, uh, for example, in the field of epigenetics on the effects of nanoparticles, of course, in, in, on health, uh, new materials for preparing more durable and prosthesis and implants, bone substitutes, and in the particular case we are talking about today, in antimicrobial uh, materials, uh, uh, this, uh, as you said before, uh, firstly working for uh, uh, fighting against bacteria, and now we have adapted it uh, to, to virus. So uh, a brief history, uh, when the pandemic uh, that was caused by the SARS-CoV-2 emerged at the beginning of 2020, 
CSI created the uh, interdisciplinary platform, uh, the global health, in order to collaborate finding solutions against uh, this global problem. This, this platform investigates solutions against the, these problems from very different approaches, such as prevention, illness, uh, suppression, treatment, impact, and dissemination. Uh, and in our case, in the CINN, two research projects with principal investigators belongs to our center were, were started. Uh, one of the projects led by Professor uh, Mario Fraga uh, has as objective uh, to develop a new methods for rapid and efficient identification of SARS-CoV-2 RNA. And the second one that is led by Dr. Belen Cabal and me, uh, investigate the design and preparation of new inorganic uh, biocide uh, materials. And uh, well, I led my colleague Belen to, to present briefly this, this project. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the organization for giving us the opportunity to present the research we, we are developing. We started working on this, uh, this area uh, already a year ago, thanks to the funding obtained from CSIC to carry out uh, this project. The objective of this project is to develop antimicrobial surfaces capable of eliminating or reducing the viral loads on them. People can infect it with coronavirus to do contact with surfaces. The risk of this transmission can be controlled or reduced by increasing, for instance, ventilation, wearing masks uh, correctly, um, cleaning and disinfection, disinfecting surfaces can also reduce the risk of the infection. Cleaning is an essential uh, first step in any disinfection process, helps to remove pathogens or significant, significantly reduce their load on contaminated surfaces, but uh, not inactivate the microorganisms for this. Uh, everybody knows that it's necessary to use chemical disinfectants that can kill every, any remaining uh, microorganisms. But what's the problem? The problem is that the effectiveness of these processes may be altered due to the other factors, such as change, changes in humidity, temperature, uh, not use the appropriate concentration of disinfectants, Contact, the, time, the contact time of the disinfectants with the surfaces, compatibility of the disinfectants with surfaces, or even the toxicity. Unfortunately, these measures are not durable. The surfaces can be contaminated again over time, and then cleaning and disinfection processes would have to be repeated. So the possibility to develop antimicrobial materials or surfaces can be considered uh, complementary actions to prevent the indirect transmissions of the coronavirus or even transmissions of other disease. We have a long experience in the design, synthesis, and characterization of different inorganic antimicrobials. Uh, the kind of materials we investigate are based on supported uh, metallic or metal oxide nanoparticles, such as silver, copper, Thinocytes, which are well known antimicrobials for thousands of years. And we also investigate in different formulations of novel antimicrobial glasses and glass ceramics. These materials are antimicrobials of growth spread spectrum. We prove the efficacy of this of them and gain some of the most common pathogens, including bacteria and yeast. Uh, one important thing is that these materials are non toxic and can be considered environmentally friendly. Our experience began in the field of health. We are a material center, and at that time, we were investigating on new biomaterials for implantology. Everybody knows uh, that one of the main problems with implants are related with infections caused by microorganisms. Um, we developed a long-lasting antimicrobial coatings for dental implants, these antimicrobial coatings prevent implant-associated infections at the dental implant site and consequently improving also integration without any potential side effects. The efficacy of this coating was proven not only by in vitro or in vivo tests, but also clinically. But we never evaluated the activity of these materials against virus, viruses before. In the context of the project uh, of uh, 
COVID, uh, the first step was, was to evaluate the sensibility of different kinds of virus, including SARS-CoV-2, to this type of antimicrobials. We studied how the properties of these materials can influence their antiviral activity and also the mechanisms that explains how they are. At the end, uh, we obtained two series of different materials based on silver and copper oxide nanoparticles supported on low-cost clays and also a new family of glasses that can completely remove coronavirus in a really short time, less than, than one hour. When we, when we optimize these materials, their formulations and properties, the next step in the project was uh, to investigate how to apply these materials. These active cavities on different kinds of substrates, metallic, ceramics, polymers, taking, taking into account that they cannot lose their effectiveness once they are incorporated. For this purpose, uh, we evaluated different technologies and strategies. We developed uh, paints, for instance, the sample um, paints with different content of these of these materials, and also we prepare uh, posi uh, resin, different polymers that uh, uh, this this is for for instance. I'm going to Different, different, different resins that incorporate the, the these materials. Uh, now we are still working on this. Uh, we observe activity, but further investigation is necessary in order to obtain a, be a better performance of, of these materials. More or less, uh, is summarized where we are. The project is. Muchas <laughs> gracias. Muchas gracias y, y mil disculpas. I have to apologize. No falo asturiano, sino. No, 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 no. Don't, don't worry. It's only in order to know uh, where uh, we uh, are placed. Uh, exactly. uh, uh, this wonderful, actually, town of Lentrevu. You <laughs> can imagine that it must be much more pleasant, actually, to do research there than, than maybe in the heart of a big city. So okay. I would like to perhaps ask if, uh, if uh, Marina, for example, or Dr. Shokmel are, are tuning in, if you were able to listen to these applications, because I think it's very interesting. They showed some examples of, of how they, they can be actually applied, but uh, uh, what was thought of as antimicrobial, I mean, uh, based on, on bacteria is now the different uses it, it can have. And I wanted to see if you had any questions or anything to say, especially Dr. Shokmel and, or, or Marina, who, who, has, uh, who have had experience on this. Okay, shall I start? Sure. Um, well, I think uh, this is highly exciting, obviously, what you are doing. And as you mentioned, the, the most uh, of your experience has been with the antibacterial effects, and, uh, particularly when it comes to implant-associated infections. Um, now, in terms of antiviral effects, um, obviously, what I what comes to mind to me is uh, beyond COVID. Huh? Um, for example, if I think of intubated patients and of the endotracheal tubes huh, that really remain in in the airways for for days, actually, and where viral uh, diseases can play a role, although very often difficult to diagnose uh, or to know exactly are they bystanders or are they a main pathogen or are they actually working uh, in association with bacteria uh, or causing a common kind of disease. So coating uh, certain types of materials such as endotracheal tubes, is that something you are envisaging? Because that goes far beyond COVID obviously, but still will remain interesting for COVID as well. I absolutely agree with uh, with Professor Stockman. Uh, in fact, I think that there are uh, several, let's say, beauties of these coatings. One is that with the, these uh, these these procedures, we 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 made less waste from the health sector. 
which is uh, extremely important for, uh, for, for our environment, but also for the circularity of the health sector itself and, uh, and, the, and the waste that can be generated that sometimes is really difficult to, to make it uh, disappear. The second question is also the toxicity of some of the disinfectants that are sometimes used using uh, so uh, I with with these nano coatings really uh, we are tackling one of the points and, and is maybe the, the high toxicity of some of the disinfectants that are used maybe not in Europe but also in European countries that they have less uh, less 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 means and then the durability because I as I have understood most of these coatings also has the beauty of, of allow these materials to have much longest life, uh, which is which is really interesting for the for the efficiency of of our systems and uh, from the economical point of view as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, Dr. Fernando Ticabal, could you please reply on that? That's very interesting on these issues of, of application, no? From the from that were uh, put by uh, to you by Dr. Shokmel and, 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 and Marina, please. Uh, well, okay. Uh, can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, it's true. Uh, the, the benefits of dignum kit materials in terms of durability, we are talking about uh, inorganic materials. So we are always talking about very long time in which they preserve the, the, the functionality. Uh, what is different, for example, from organic solutions that are very effective, but short time, short time uh, uh, in, duration, in duration. Concerning the, the toxicity, we are sure that we are working with a non-toxic material because it was previously tested in implants and there were done uh, studies on animals and it was completely uh, identified that, for example, in an alternative application as bone graft, we can say that new bone was generated on the surface of the material, so no toxicity was, was appreciated. So the to toxicity is not a problem, and the duration is longer, and this kind of application, like tubes, for example, when we are talking about uh, antimicrobial surfaces, uh, we can firstly think on common life uh, surfaces, but it's true that it can be very interesting in these surfaces in hospitals or surfaces in companies that, it, that are in contact with patients, in which the introduction of these uh, additives can be very, very interesting. So I don't know if you yeah. want to complete something. Yeah, another uh, important thing of these materials is that they are very versatile. Versa 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 uh, we can modify the formulations, we can uh, modify the compositions, we can optimize, we can functionalize. So we open the possibility, the possible applications of these materials, not only for biomedical, biomedical applications uh, like uh, coatings of the implants and on healthcare settings, but also in other completely different uh, applications. For instance, uh, we are uh, studying the possibility to develop uh, biodegradable polymers uh, for uh, food packing, uh, for food packaging, uh, using these materials as uh, fillers or coatings of these uh, biodegradable polymers. Uh, now we we have a, a, a European project on this subject. Uh, another possible uh, application of these materials that we are also investigating is the, the possible use in wastewater treatment. Uh, we, we are uh, involved in the development of a, a pilot plan for the wastewater or for the treatment of the, the disinfection, microbial disinfection of wastewater. Um, and the, the possibilities of use of this material is so huge. Even uh, we are exploring the possibility of use in agriculture. Uh, all of us know that the European Union uh, are uh, taking care um, to, to reduce the, the use of, spe of pesticides. Uh, um, these materials can be also uh, be utilized as we are exploring the possibility to use in, in this agriculture field in order to fight against uh, phyto, phytopathogens uh, that affect uh, crops or 
uh, many uh, cultures that uh, are so important from a, an economical point of view. So uh, the, the possible applications are so huge. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. And, and I, I'm asking all the speakers you, at the same time with all the participants, don't hesitate since I'm, I have, I see you on the screen, but don't hesitate if you want to intervene uh, uh, before or after you are, you know, you let us know and drop us a, a message on the chat. But thank you. I just uh, wanted to thank you again, the director and the lead investigator at the thing from Asturias. I had one last question is um, I understand what, that now, of course, this has a lot of potential, these applications. You may be looking for partners to scale up uh, maybe production. Is that a possibility? How, how because you, you create this, you know, this product in, in the end, how, how does that make it to the, to the broader marketplace? Yes, yes, it's true. Uh, we are working in, in, in two things uh, simultaneously. Uh, we are working with one spin-off from our research center in order to commercialize this these products. So first thing is to register this product as biocides. That is, it, it takes time, but we are working on it uh, at this moment. And uh, one advantage of the production of these uh, uh, additives is that the, the experimental procedures are relatively common in the ceramic industry. So it's not very complex, but it's needed an uh, investment in order to, to have the, the experimental media in order to produce few quantities. But is not a problem from the technical point of view to scale up the production of these materials. Thank you so much. We will proceed. We're already getting some questions, but I will, some of them are not specifically related to the actual discussion. So we will leave them for a little later because I want to hear from the speakers we haven't uh, uh, heard from yet. And I'd like to, uh, then we are traveling to Spain. I know I think we're talking just, I don't want to make a mistake again. Uh, I'll ask Dr. <laughs> Dr. Lagaron, where he's uh, presently, but Dr. Lagaron is group leader and founder of the, of the group Novel Materials and Nanotechnology at the Institute of Agrochemistry and Food Technology, IATA, of the Spanish uh, uh, Council for, for Scientific Research, CESIC, located in Valencia. So I know the Institute is in Valencia, but we'll, we'll, he'll let us know if he's actually in Valencia today. Um, he's the head of the joint unit, uh, uh, with uh, the CESIC and the University Jaume I uh, in, in Valencia on the issue of polymers uh, technology. He's also a founder of different technology-based companies. He has a PhD in physical sciences in polymer uh, physics, uh, especially, uh, and he's worked for several years as, as DSM uh, researcher in the Netherlands, BP Chemicals, so he's a researcher. He has an experience also in, 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 in the industry side. Uh, and he's coordinator of, of two major a Horizon 2020 European projects, uh, YPAC and usable uh, packaging in cir circular bioeconomy. Today, we invited uh, Dr. Lagaron to be with us because uh, of a specific uh, initiative that I think uh, in a way will take us back to a very, you know, uh, difficult time when this pandemic broke out over a year ago. And, and uh, perhaps we have forgotten, we all wearing these masks uh, today. Uh, we, they can be found uh, all kinds of prices, all formats uh, throughout the market, but that wasn't so uh, at the time. As you well remember, we didn't, there was a scarcity of many of these uh, products, including masks. Uh, and, and we have invited Dr. Lagaron because uh, the, the research group I just mentioned is responsible for a new uh, uh, patented antiviral and biodegradable new filtration system based on, on nanofibers, again, nanotechnology, for anti-COVID-19 uh, masks and perhaps other applications. And I would like to, to ask Dr. Lagaron to please tell us where he is uh, now. He is connecting from Valencia, just out of curiosity or anywhere else to tell us a bit about this group and to tell us about, uh, about this initiative, how it came about, how, you know, take us back a bit uh, to those sad times where, you know, we couldn't find, there were no masks about the de delocalization of industries, of, uh, et cetera. So thank you so much, Professor. It's a pleasure to have you here. Muchas gracias, Profesor, y bienvenido. Good morning. Buenos dias. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sergi. 
and the rest of the embassy team for uh, for inviting us and to to tell us uh, the story and how we became flexible to help right which i think is one of the primary objectives of, of uh, public researchers. We gather knowledge, but eventually over time, our responsibility is to cast this knowledge into those needed areas uh, where, where we can really help the population who is in the first place uh, paying our, our salaries, right? So let me just show a few slides on, on the journey that we did. I'm not sure if you can see my screen. Okay, very good, thank you. So, uh, yeah, so what we did is we were working for a very long time in developing nanofiber-based technologies for different applications, uh, food packaging, uh, pharmaceutical uh, applications for control release of APIs and also in biomedical and cosmetic uh, areas. Uh, and in fact, uh, the team is is based in Valencia. So Sergi was right <laughs> this time <laughs> around. Uh, so we are a team, a multidisciplinary team that bridges uh, the, uh, the efforts or the, the work over two institutions. The Spanish Council for Scientific Research, the Institute of Agrochemistry and Food Technology, and the University Jaume I in Castellón, which is a little bit 60 kilometers north of Valencia. Uh, we have a, what is called an associated unit, a unit, joint unit in, in polymers technologies. Uh, over the years, uh, through this innovation code, we have been developed different technologies, the ones that we could not find an industrial partner to take to the market. We decided to, uh, to do it ourselves uh, via the creation of several startups. The technology that I will describe today has been scaled uh, on, on right now in a manufacturing and commercialization stage uh, via this spin-off company from our group called BioInitia. BioInitia is actually a group now uh, that has an engineering division which actually made the equipment. So we do not only develop the applications, but we also make the equipment at different scales that make possible the uh, scaling and the uh, translation to the market of these the initial lab scale technologies. And then uh, there is this ProVail, uh, which is the technology we created with the pandemic uh, for uh, developing new filtration media, because as, as the uh, Sergi was uh, saying, uh, the beginning of the pandemic, we all face a very serious problem. And that problem was the scarcity of a uh, filter media which was delocalized uh, in the years uh, prior to the pandemic in the in the it has been localized probably for over 10 years already uh, to asia uh, particularly to china and turkey so what happens is when the when we had to cross uh, to close the borders uh, uh, then it became very difficult to access some of these prophylactic products and therefore, uh, it was also considered a strategic material in China, for instance, and for, for, uh, for, an, for a number of months, it was not able, it was not possible to, to get those materials uh, back in Europe. So it was very difficult situation. Personally, I was very strongly affected because my, my sister and husband they run a hospital in Navarra and they got infected at the beginning of the pandemic together with about six or nine, six or seven colleagues, medical uh, doctors, because they could not get uh, protection, right? It was not available, PPEs, and there was only some surgical masks available, etc. 
So what is the problem here? The problem here is the aerial transmission of this, uh, of this uh, virus, which, what does it mean? Well, it means that when we talk, when we uh, cough, uh, when we sneeze, etc., we produce aerosols, and these aerosols are very tiny particles, very tiny, very small, in the range uh, between uh, 0.1 micron and five microns are the ones that are more uh, prone to stay in the air, right? So if we are in a closed room with somebody who has, uh, who has been infected and is in, the, is in a position where it's able to, uh, to, to expel uh, this, this virus, when we are in this room with that person, even if we are keeping the distance, the problem is these small aerosols that will slowly dissipate all across the room and then eventually other people can breathe them in. So the prophylactic protection, uh, it became very, uh, as, a, as an immediate measure at the beginning of the pandemic already. And, and then it became uh, uh, mandatory to, to, uh, to use different masks to protect ourselves from large droplets, but also for small droplets. So what we did is, okay, there is no filter media available. We do know that there are in Spain companies that are able to manufacture masks, but they cannot access the material. So how can we, how can we help, right? So with our expertise in these nanofibers, what we did is to develop uh, within a one and a half month uh, also, uh, the same as my colleagues from, from uh, Asturias, with the help, uh, with the co-financing of the uh, Salud Global platform of the CSIC, and also with the uh, help, with the funding from the uh, Generalitat Valenciana, the local government here in the Valencian region, we got a little bit of money to actually take this endeavor together with the company and bring it into a, a production state. So the company had to, so we had to develop the filter media. Eventually we, uh, we did that, we patented within one month and a half after the pandemic started. Uh, what is new about this? So what, what is new is that we're using extremely thin fibers, thousand times smaller than the cross section of a human hair. So they're really tiny. They're very long. They are extremely long fibers, but they are very thin. So what does it mean? What it means is that we can actually produce a filter media, which is 60 times smaller than the conventional one that was produced in China at the time. And, and therefore, we are able to reduce the thickness of the filter. And as a consequence, also, we can do very thin masks, which are extremely uh, efficient against the uh, penetration of aerosols. So we developed these two technologies. One of them was the rolls, the filter media that could be used to, uh, by, by our partner companies to do these masks. But also we developed these uh, replaceable uh, filters that can be used in, in permanent type of masks so that the people just need to replace uh, every two days or so the, the filter media. Uh, so what is the, the, the achievements then that we did with this technology? And again, uh, the important thing here is that we were able to use our knowledge to and to give answer to a, to a problem that was uh, really uh, there. And, and therefore, uh, this, this flexibility, I think, is the message to take home. Uh, so scientists have the knowledge, but this knowledge, uh, when we are really confronted with a big challenge, I think we, we are able to respond very efficiently, very fast. And the company should actually uh, trust more the research that is done in big institutions because sorry. Uh, the, it will Dr. help Lagarone, very I'm quickly. Sorry. I don't know if I, if, I, if I caught you by mistake. I'm sorry. I just wanted to, to ask you uh, uh, about, you know, because, you know, we, the consumers go to the supermarket. We, from, go, we went from having zero uh, of these uh, 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 uses and, and items like the mask to having now a broad selection. 
many of these Correct. masks, people, we're all on a budget. We go to the supermarket, we we find this mask. Man, the cheaper ones are made in other continents, uh, uh, not to mention any country specifically. But what are the advantages of why should we, uh, why this uh, prevail technology, should, you know, is better? In which way is it better than any other? Uh, mass that we find in the market and and tell us if this technology can be found as well can can someone in Belgium in Luxembourg in in the US buy this mask and if not how soon thank you okay very good sir so it's just the slide that I'm showing right now the advantages so uh, what are the advantages uh, the advantages is that the the mask can be disinfected with alcohol sprays which is something that the traditional technology cannot do it, it has an antiviral capacity as well. So the filter media uh, has been incorporated with an antiviral, with an, uh, it, which is not only killing virus, but also bacteria in a very short time. Uh, and then because of the massive use of all of these masks, uh, we, underst we understood and we anticipated that that was going to cause uh, an environmental problem. So we wanted to make a version of it that would be biodegradable and we have achieved that too. So there is uh, ultra thin uh, masks that, uh, that are extremely efficient in protection against the virus and then they offer comfort. And here is some examples where we can see how this mask, which look a, a little bit similar to the ones that you can find, uh, but they are extremely thin. And they are very efficient uh, against the aerosols with a very small sizes, even below 0 0.3, 0 0.4 microns. We are blocking very efficiently that. And then we can see the breathability, how we are able to more efficiently dissipate the heat, water, and carbon dioxide by virtue of this uh, extremely thin uh, filter. Eventually, we also made a biodegradable uh, version of it which is biodegrading under industrial home uh, composting conditions, but more importantly, also in the sea. We, we bury some of our masks at the bottom of the sea in the coast of Calpe in Alicante. And you can see that even if the mask is at the bottom of the sea, it's not able to move with the waves or anything because it's trapped into a net, uh, it's able to uh, biodegrade uh, at the same speed as it would do the paper. So uh, with this, I uh, would also like to thank uh, the people involved who at the beginning of the pandemic spent nights, Saturdays and Sundays to be able to develop this technology and all of you for, for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And, and again, I see this always happens. Uh, you know, time is never enough because all of you have so much to say. We could do a webinar just on each one of these wonderful initiatives. Uh, I want to go to David Gehring and thank you for your patience. You've been patiently waiting there. Uh, uh, and I, I, we, we kind of come full circle and, and, and uh, because of all the different aspects we discussed, we've talked to policymakers, we've talked to uh, the medical profession, to researchers, and now we're going to the, to the pharmaceutical industry because uh, David Gehring uh, is here representing Pharma, BE, Pharma Belgium, an association, a platform of uh, of uh, over 130 uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, companies based in in in, uh, in Belgium, he's had an experience in in, in other companies in TUI, in in the European Commission, etc. As a communicator, I'm very happy. I can I must say as well to have a communicator on board, so to help me better communicate to our audience what uh, what we are trying to to convey. And and David, I would like to ask you. Uh, to first give us an overview of Pharma Valley, because I believe this is a very one of the larger platforms that I know of, national platforms of of of, uh, of this nature. And also, if you can already, since we're running a bit tight on time, uh, if you can already uh, bring into your presentation the kind of the role that you think the pharmaceutical industry can play uh, in Belgium, where wh what are the, your positions on some of the policies, perhaps uh, uh, regarding. Uh, 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 vaccines today, for example, how, uh, how you know, what, what, what is it, uh, are you in favor or not of export restrictions uh, when we want to, when some of governments want to limit and control the stock to be able that, uh, to ensure that their own populations are well 
uh, you know, have access to these vaccines, etc. There's a lot of issues. I know it's going to be uh, very little time, but thank you for being with us, David, and, and the floor is yours, as it were. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you uh, to everybody. Thanks for having us today. Um, I'll keep it short and sweet. And if there's questions, then please don't hesitate to uh, to interfere. So um, PharmaDB is the um, the association of over 130 pharmaceutical uh, companies in Belgium, uh, including the smaller ones, the startups, but also the bigger ones. And the majority of them are um, having their uh, medication on the market. Um, do also have orphan drugs uh, and uh, focus on human health. Almost 10% of our members are focusing on animal health. So the Pharma Valley, um, that is how we like to call Belgium, is uh, a very important player in Europe, always in the top three when it comes to research and development um, in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, uh, and that shows off by a uh, high population of headquarters, but especially research and development facilities from those pharmaceutical companies in Belgium, over 50. Um, and what is important here is that Belgium has a great system in working together between the private sector, the pharmaceutical companies, um, but also universities, uh, research centers, and academic hospitals. And because all these uh, parties work together in finding solutions, uh, Belgium has that top three uh, position in Europe. Um, maybe just a quick look on uh, what the sector is, how big it is in, in Belgium, really. There is over one patent application per day uh, coming from Belgium, and that is a high increase during the last five, uh, five years. And um, it's not only about research and development, it's also about export and import. 12.5% of the total Belgian exports relate to medicines and uh, vaccines. And obviously, that also has a huge impact on uh, the financial side of things. Now, uh, Belgium is a big uh, player in the pharmaceutical industry, also in exportations. Uh, Spain is included in the top 10 coming from Belgian uh, exports in the pharmaceutical industry. And um, uh, that means that Belgium has a really good position in uh, that field, but also in the field of research and development, as I said previously, showing clearly by the number of clinical trials in affected, uh, being affected in Belgium. And these uh, clinical trials um, are being conducted over a whole, whole range of um, pathologies. Uh, as you can see here, um, it is something where once again, this would not be possible if there was not that kind of collaboration between the pharmaceutical industry, the universities, the hospitals, and the research facilities. Now, um, why we are here today is to give you a, a, an idea of how many people we do represent, and if uh, we can be of service in bringing you in contact with some of our members, then we will be more than happy to help you with that. And that can be in a range of, of, of um, topics, uh, going from clinical trials to legal advice, uh, bringing you in contact with other people who might be interested in working together on this. So basically, Pharma.be wants to build bridges with all stakeholders in the healthcare system. Thank you very much. I hope it was short enough. Very sweet, and you're very generous because uh, I know we are short on time, but I'd like to ask you, and then I'm gonna also go back to, to, to Dr. Katri and Dr. Shekmel uh, to react on this, but one question, because these are something that m many uh, of our followers and, and citizens ask about. What, since you're, you know, what is, what is, what are the issues regarding, I mean, if, if, if vaccine is the solution, as we all agree, I've heard this is the ultimate solution, notwithstanding all the other initiatives, why do we hear so much about problems with vaccines and production? Do you think that uh, many of us wonder, many citizens wonder, what, uh, why in Israel uh, they were able to, or in the United States are able to go at a particular speed, or in Australia, and, and why are we having these issues in the EU? Is it the production side? Is it the demand side? Is it policy, if you kindly wouldn't mind, uh, uh, you know, giving giving us your perspective on this. Thank you. David. Of course. Yeah, no problem. Um, I think, well, 
you know, there, there has been a lot of talk about what has gone wrong during this whole pandemic and who is to blame and who did what and how. Um, basically, I think that from a, from a pharmaceutical industry perspective, I do think that uh, the communication has been really, really important and there have been made some mistakes from coming from our industry, think of AstraZeneca, for example, uh, not saying that they did not communicate well, but the world has changed. So today in this global pandemic um, situation, everybody is connected and, and news travels so fast and everybody has an opinion and everybody is now an expert. So we did have so many different sources of information that um, uh, a lot of people were confused or were worried. Still today, we can see it, we've heard it earlier on uh, in Luxembourg, people do not want to get their vaccine because they think it's not safe. Um, so in, in that perspective, I think um, there, there, there was a huge issue on communication. Uh, and to come back to your question, why did it take so long? Um, because once again, uh, Probably we didn't achieve to explain correctly to people that a vaccine is not a cookie. A vaccine is a very complex biological product that cannot be uh, produced by just pushing a button. And uh, same goes for upscaling production, for example. Apparently, we have not been able to communicate correctly to people why this is so such a complex um, uh, stage of, of, of upscaling and, and, and giving uh, the world what it needs. So um, there is still some work to do for all of us, I think, to explain what we're doing and why things might take some time, because we're dealing with public health, of course, and nobody wants to take any risk in that perspective. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much again. We're going to go. I would like to take, we have a couple of questions from the audience, but I would like, because we have uh, four minutes left, and I'd like to ask Dr. Katri if he'd be so, if you wanted to have any comment on this issue of vaccines or any of the solutions that were mentioned earlier from the nanotechnology perspective, Dr. Katri, would you like to mention or uh, speak on that? Yes, thank you. One, one of my main um, suggestions is that we start also to work with negative tests. So there are a lot of tests performed, executed um, with the negative results and nobody works with that. But I think as a good starting point, a negative test is as much of value as a positive test because the money is spent and the result can really help for monitoring not only COVID, but also many other diseases. And we really should um, upgrade the value of a negative test. And I think that is not only so for, co for communicable diseases, but for all diseases. Knowing that somebody is negative for something is today as much as informative as a positive test. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for, for being so brief. And now we go to a final word. I would like to go to Dr. Shakmel. And, and in fact, Dr. Shakmel, there is a question on the, on the chat. If we can go back, if we can scroll down, Javier, on the chat up there, there was a question. So I'd like you to react to these issues of vaccine. To, and then there was one specific question for you uh, coming from Luxembourg. Uh, early in early 2021, Luxembourg Prime Minister took two decisions that I believe were not in line with the advice from experts. One was to open all shops while incidence was growing through uh, moderately. Other was to vaccinate with AstraZeneca those over age uh, 70. Looking at this from today's perspective, were they adequate? So if you want to take this final word before I wrap it up and also include any other comment you might have on the previous speakers. Thank you, Dr. Shakmel. Yes, so I mean, coming back to opening shops in Luxembourg beginning of uh, 2021, um, I think that um, it didn't uh, provoke much harm because it was uh, done in a controlled fashion. Now, obviously we have a special situation because we have many people in cross-border, people coming in and doing their shopping in Luxembourg, particularly if they cannot do so in their home country. 
and that uh, to some extent raised uh, the volume uh, associated with that uh, activity when it came to shopping. But all in all, I think that this was not a major problem because meanwhile, after one year of the pandemic, we had learned uh, how to limit uh, the risks. Now, when it comes to AstraZeneca, we are back to the beginning because now um, some countries in Europe uh, recommend it uh, for people aged uh, uh, above a certain age. So in Luxembourg now, which is from last week, uh, it is recommended for people aged uh, 55 plus. And um, if you are aged between 30 and 55, and uh, you can have it on a voluntary basis. So on a voluntary basis, you can uh, register yourself if you would like to have the AstraZeneca, but otherwise uh, now it will be for age, uh, ages 55 plus. So uh, finally, we, uh, at the beginning, we didn't want to give it to elderly people because of lack of data. And now the data are there, we know it's highly efficient. Um, now we don't want to give it to younger people, at least some countries have decided to do so, and we are back to give it to elderly people, so or people of a certain age. So I think that giving it to people aged 70 and more was not a problem, uh, and actually is in line what has been decided in Luxembourg uh, last week. Now, if I, can, if I can come back uh, to the presentation of Dr. Lagaron. Um, there, there might be a very important selling point when it comes to his mask, but uh, he must tell us about it. Um, there's, as was mentioned by you, uh, Sergi, there was scarcity with masks, and many masks were surgical masks, you know, the simple kind of masks um, that use cotton in general. And also there was a total lack of an industry standard. Now, if these masks were intended to uh, initially to be worn for perhaps, uh, you know, two hours, three or four hours, because of scarcity, people would wear them for a whole day, would wear them for seven days, but perhaps wear them for a week or so. And then the, here there can be a safety issue, because if you look at this material, such as cotton, it will be worn over time. And so there is always a risk that, you know, you might actually uh, inspire, inspirate, fine particulate matter, you know, very small um, material like nano or micro-sized material that comes from the mass and that will go down into your lungs. Um, so now you told us that your mass withstands uh, even being at the bottom of the sea, but I think this is a safety issue um, that is important because um, very often those masks are worn well beyond the time they are intended to be worn. Um, and then also once you have a, 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 um, give an answer to that, um, the same thing applies obviously after disinfection. And what I would want to know is, is there an industry uh, standard now? I know people are working on it, but I think it is much necessary. However, I still believe it will not answer necessarily my first question, which is a safety question. Right. So, and, uh, and unfortunately, we, we have we don't have time for more. Uh, we we know we ask always we ask the impossible of you, and and we know that from the beginning because there's so much to be said. I'm I'm still I was trying to keep concentrated, but every you know I find there's so much information. Just to reassure those who are following us, we will continue on the networking part of this. We if there is interest, professional interest or general uh, knowledge interest, we will post all this information. We will post this video also uh, shortly, we will edit it and it will be on our website so you can review. I want to again, thank all of you for your precious time. You've been very generous. I know you're very busy people. I know you've heard this a lot. People don't clap anymore at eight o'clock. I think we should be clapping all day long. We are literally in your hands. And I'd like to uh, just close with a few, it's impossible to summarize what has been said here today, but I just kept some, some buzzwords, if you will that I really think uh, summarize what we discussed here today. Partnership was mentioned, no borders, trial and error, which is at the essence of the scientific process. Trial and error, you mentioned um, 
nursing homes, you mentioned delocalization, how quickly we're able to learn from experience. So sometimes we tend to be very negative, but it's amazing how much we were able to bounce back and react and be flexible to help, which was Dr. Lagaron's uh, also uh, uh, sentence, not that I really appreciate it, be flexible. You're there, you're vocational, you're, uh, you're serving a public purpose and, and, and showing this flexibility uh, to help. Today, as you know, is Earth Day, is World Earth Day. Viruses, as you can see, some of these photos show have been with us even before us. You know, as part of the planetary experience, we need to, it's a whole process learning how to live with these viruses, uh, how they have modified our behavior. Thanks to all your efforts, we're better able to do so. I also wanted just to share with you, uh, if I may, this may be a bit uh, out of the ordinary, but I just got this breaking news from CNN. Uh, you know, there's this summit going on that was called for by President Biden. And there is this news that is it's confirmed uh, that President Biden will announce that the US will aim to cut carbon emissions by as much as 52% by 2030 at this virtual climate summit. Uh, so I think good news, you have given us good news. You have given us hope. And of course, there's no easy solutions. Like David Gehring said, making vaccines is not like making cookies, but, uh, but we're pretty close there. We're pretty amazed at how uh, uh, amazingly the scientific uh, fabric of, of our countries has adapted to this and how the industry side is able to, to translate that into a reality. Again, thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Merci beaucoup. Thank you well. And tot sins. And we'll see you again soon. Please stay tuned. Thank you all. Goodbye. Goodbye.